In today's episode of HF Visionaries, we talk to Shashank. We talk about how he helped building a skill-focused organization. Stay tuned. Welcome to HR Visionaries, where we unlock the secrets of modern HR. I'm Benjamin, your host. Join us as we shed light on today's HR universe with HR leaders and innovators from across the globe. Whether you're an HR pro, a business leader, or just curious about the future of work, this is your shortcut to the forefront of HR innovation. Brought to you by Hire, the AI talent attraction platform. Welcome to the latest episode of HR Visionaries. I'm very much looking forward to my guest today, Shashank. It's great to have you. Thank you very much, Ben. It's a pleasure and an honor to be on your podcast. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm very excited to learn about well what, what you're doing, but perhaps you can um, let us know in, in a few sentences, who are you? Well, for... Um... I, you know, professionally, if I were to you know class classify myself, I am a business executive, business leader, who has happened to specialize in human resources. Um, I mean, HR partner, someone who works uh, very closely with the business, loves to work with business, makes an impact on you know how the business outcomes are and shape the culture of organizations. Um, and uh, I've been fortunate enough to um, to have uh, an experience in different kinds of you know, geographies now, uh, different companies, large companies. Last 13 years, I met BMC Software, uh, where I started off as head of HR and chief operating officer in India. Uh, I went on to become the CEO uh, and the head of HR. I also looked after the HR for Asia Pacific region. Uh, and then for the last three and a half years or so, I have been leading, I set up the entire function of talent as an architect of talent programs uh, based out of the US, uh, the headquarters. So. I've had, you know, uh, diversity in, in that experience, richness uh, in what I have been able to do. And uh, I completely enjoy uh, what I really uh, do on a day-to-day -day basis. You, know, you get paid for doing something that you find as fun. Well, that's it, great, right? It's a bit, bit like an astronaut, perhaps. Um, um, so um, it's, I, I must say, I always look forward to, um, to this, well, let's say, elevator pitch um because it, it it tells you so much about um about about, about a person so, since you mentioned in, in the very beginning um you are a business leader who happens to specialize in hr um why is that so important for you to be a business leader who happens to specialize in hr well my education was as a specialization in hr uh, and but i very quickly understood that whether it's HR or finance or marketing or sales, they are all the engines that drive uh, the business. Business exists for a purpose uh, and that purpose needs to be accomplished for it to be successful. And each one of us brings certain value from our respective specializations uh, to, to, to add value to the business and the business outcomes. And therefore it's very, very important whether I'm an HR professional or a marketing or a sales or a finance, that you understand how the business really operates. How does it make money? Uh, how does how do people relate with that business? What outcomes is the business driving? And and if you do not, if you do not understand that intrinsically well, um, you may not be as successful as you think you should be. I think it's a very important perspective to um well, to realize well as an. As an organization, it's a bit like an organism, right? So you can't live without certain parts and therefore being interconnected is so incredibly important, um, not just to appreciate other people's work, but also understand, okay, how can I be more effective in my role and how can be, well, how can I serve um, the, the company in a more efficient way? Absolutely. It's, it's like a jigsaw puzzle you know, and different pieces need to fit in exactly well to be able to have that you know clear picture at the end of the day so uh, and and i and i think uh, i've completely enjoyed this journey of uh, of being in an hr role driving business outcomes uh, and i i don't think there could be any better you know success or pleasure out of success from there well you mentioned before that you have um, assumed the roles of well, regional HR heads. Um, can you well? Can you take us a 
bit with you on on this journey. Um, so uh, when you took up your first leadership role, what were your thoughts back then? Scared. Um, <laughs> I I was <laughs> I was not even forty then, and um, I had seen my bosses who were head of HRs at that moment. Uh, they were uh, relatively more senior. Uh, I wouldn't say older, but mm -hmm. you know you somehow have the sense that you have to have a lot many more years of experience, a lot of gray hair, you know, sagging skin uh, to be in that position. Uh, one of my bosses were very, was a very, uh, very outstanding uh, communicator. Uh, mm -hmm. He was magic on stage. And I never, I never saw myself like that. So I was petrified initially when I took up this role. Uh, I was confident uh, because I had been, you know, like the second in line for a few years before that. But being the person now who has accountability, uh, who is the face of the function uh, in front of the organization and to the external world, it, it took some getting used to, you know. Mm -hmm. So just to give a, you know, example, funny example on, I think on the fourth or the fifth day, uh, there was a program that was getting, when I, I joined as the head of HR, I, jo uh, I was asked to inaugurate a program that was happening in the office. And they said, oh, you have to give a speech. And I said, what, me, speech? You know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and that must have been the shortest speech anybody would have given because I literally said, hello, I'm Shashank. Welcome to this program. Thank you very much. Enjoy all the best. And, and I was off. Uh, but I realized that people want to hear, people want to get context of what is happening, why it is happening, how is it going to benefit them. And I, and I think I sort of grew into this role uh, of, uh, of being a, a leader uh, and, and driving things forward from there on. So uh, from being petrified, scared, nervous, excited, um, I think I, it, it just came on as you realize the significance and the value of the role itself and the trust that the organization has on you. Well, it just mentioned uh, you grew in your role as a leader. Um, how do you effectively do this? So my, my question evolves a bit around, well, I think there are quite many people around who desire to be a leader. Some people desire explicitly not to be a leader, but basically those who desire to become leaders, um, not everyone is is born to be uh, to become a leader not everyone has uh, well a lot of emotional intelligence so how did you become a leader well that is effective in in leading an organization and leading people i think it's per perhaps most important yeah i think i think i didn't fortunate enough uh, i had enough role models in front of me uh, who were great leaders i started with my own family my father uh, he was a uh, head of a head of a research and training institute. I saw him lead people. I saw how people revered him and, and followed him wherever he was. Uh, and then when I started my life you know, in, in college, similarly, I had good, great professors uh, who I looked up. And when I started my career, uh, I mean, I, I think I've been absolutely blessed. I've had some wonderful, outstanding managers. Um, who taught me very well on, uh, you know, how a leader should be, you know, what is expected of the leaders. And then on the way, I also met and came across certain not so good leaders. Uh, okay. And I still learned from them to say, to really say, okay, what is that one should not be as a leader? What is, you know, uh, when, I, when, when I moved from one company to the other, this is about 20 years back, the CEO of my company sent a note to me saying, now that you're in a leader's position, do what you thought you always wanted to do. And I, and I think all the training, all the learnings that I had from my other managers, bosses, et cetera, just uh, you know, brought me into that sphere where I knew, yeah, this is what I should be doing. And then, of course, you pick up skills, you learn, you, know, you, you observe. Uh, you, there are some formal trainings that you go through, uh, but a lot of learning happens informally by observing others, by various other things that happens in your life. What kind of skills um, do you look for? Or, or oh, Sorry, I do it again. Um, when, when picking a role model, what, what do you think are the three or four most important topics or items you would want to tick uh, on, on, your, on your checklist to decide whether he or she is a good leader or... Um, um, or a role model that is perhaps 
um, well, serves as a negative example. I think first of all, a uh, leader needs to have a sense of purpose uh, and a clear articulation of what that purpose means by uh, that purpose is crucially important enough. The other thing that I've always uh, uh, appreciated in the leaders that I've had is their sense of empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, empathy with the environment, empathy with the people who they work with. Not everybody is less brilliant. You know, a leader's job is to essentially carry everybody along together, not just focus on you know, who is the sharpest among themselves, among, among the people there, because everybody brings values from a, from a very different perspective. Um, then being collaborative, um, being able to inculcate some of those values that it is teams those are that that succeed and not truly individuals on their own. Um, uh, being caring enough, uh, not just for the business outcomes, but for the people who drive those business outcomes. Um, subject matter knowledge, I think, of course, leaders need to have certain level of su subject matter knowledge in, in the area of they specialize, but their ability to absorb um, knowledge from the experience of others who are around them um, really is, is the difference between good and great leaders uh, who know who they need to be leveraging uh, because nobody can be expert in everything uh, that they, they need to be working on. Uh, so being able to rely, be able to delegate, be able to inspire others um, from, you know, from their vantage point uh, to excel. Uh, I think those are, those are things which are very, very crucial for leaders, great leaders. Well, um, when you now um, coach your team members, um, how do you coach them to, well, to acquire all these skills given, well, um, purpose, empathy, that's not, that's not trivial, right? So it's actually pretty hard. So one could, well, gain knowledge super easily, but, well, a, a sense of purpose that is, well, that it's uh, deeply rooted in such, in, 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 well, in, in one personality. It is, and uh, sometimes you have to provoke people to think about that sense of purpose. So uh, fundamentally and foundationally, I, I've had the pleasure and privilege of uh, you know, mentoring and, and coaching uh, quite a few people. Many of them are senior executives themselves now. Um, and I found that everybody has a very unique way of thinking and evolving themselves as professionals. Um, my role in, in all those uh, relationships has been someone who has nudged people uh, into thinking and, and articulating what their sense of purpose and where their purpose lies. Um, uh, obviously, everybody, because they are wired differently, they think differently. I've been very careful uh, in all those conversations that I'm not telling people what to do. I, I would hate to tell people what to do here. I think uh, uh, in a very classical manner, it, you, know, you, you teach people how to fish. Um, how they do it eventually is left on their own, you know, on, on their own volition. So you, you teach people how to fish, they will, they will learn how to fish in, in different kinds of waters. Uh, and, and I think that has been my objective uh, with every individual that I've worked with. Um, uh, and by the way, I've, I also believe coaching or mentorship is not one way. Uh, I have learned tremendously from uh, many, many of the people who have worked for me, um, and uh, I, I, you know, every conversation, I, I sometimes I find that oh, it's, there's a lot that is coming back to me from these people here. Because again, going back to the thing, everybody brings certain unique characteristics to the conversation. Um, so when um, when talking about these soft skills, um, I must say I find it actually quite uh, quite quite interesting how um, how the importance of soft skills like the ones you described um, have increase so tremendously over the last few years and and I personally believe that will the um, rise of generative AI um, those skills will become so much more important given well knowledge and the skill of acquiring knowledge will perhaps no longer be the bottleneck but it will be other skills you need to have in this new world where people well can delegate rather trivial tasks to AI and therefore, well, the human to human interaction will be absolutely, um, well, absolutely decisive in, in everything 
that is related to career, building a team, building a great company. That's a great point. And by the way, Ben, it is not something which is very, very new. It's not something that is being driven only by the advent of or ease of generative AI being available to all mm -hmm. of us now. Um, I think it's been coming in for a number of years, almost like a decade or so, ever since you know, technology became so ubiquitous. Everybody has access to technology. Everybody has access to devices. Uh, there's you know, software available, apps available, everything. I think this, the power skills, as I would call them, uh, the, soft, the soft skills doesn't give you the right you know, context of it. I think they're truly power skills because technologies are transient. You know? Technologies will come and go. Uh, they're the, the power skills that people possess, their ability to connect with each other, uh, interactions, uh, or their ability to collaborate in a, in a world which is so dispersed today. The resilience that you require, I mean, I started to talk a lot about res resilience during the pandemic uh, because those, that was, an, you know, I've always believed human beings are extremely resilient from the Stone Ages right through all the eras that we have lived through. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a skill, it's an attribute, it's a characteristic that has stood by us in all periods of time. You know, there's no, there has been no period ever in the history of mankind that has been stable. Uh, because things have continuously been evolving here. So the ability to, to be resilient, the ability to adapt, um, uh, ability to, to find meaning and value in, in what you do. So generative AI today is changing a lot of things. Like you said, it is, it will, it is already taking over a lot of mundane processing activities that we do, uh, but it is also now freeing up capacity in us to be able to do higher level jobs. Uh, and again, our ability to adapt and be resilient in this phase of figuring out what does that mean? Uh, you know, that a bunch of work that you thought was, you know, integral to your day-to-day -day life suddenly gone because it's being done by AI. Now, what is that you're going to do? What skills do you need now? Um, and it will depend on how adaptive you are, uh, how resilient you are and how curious you are. What kind of learning agility do you bring? Uh, those are power skills, I believe, uh, which are becoming even more crucial uh, as we speak today. Well, when um, when and also um, well, looking at, at your career in in very different jurisdictions, um, when you progressed from one to the other country, or when you moved to the other country, um, what were so so. How did you approach this? So, um, what did you have in mind when you, um, well, well, were kind of mature in one role and then assumed another role in a different country in a Euro different jurisdiction? Um, so, what were your thought process behind that? How did you prepare? How did you assume the role? So, I see nobody likes change. You know, all of us, uh, as much as we say, uh, change is inevitable. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but tell me, is there any person who really says, oh, yeah, yeah, I love the change. I want this, you know, everything to be changed. It, it was hard, you know, to move from a place where you live, you know, all your life uh, and, and a significant part of your life. Or, uh, you're, certain, you're used to a certain environment and then you move on to completely different and you make yourself vulnerable. Uh, you're completely out of it, is your comfort zone. And it was hard uh, when we moved uh, to the U.S. Uh, from India. Uh, I was uh, about 49 uh, when I moved. It's pretty late in life to be making that kind of move. And you don't know anything about it. Obviously, you know, I, I'd been here all the time uh, over the years. But it's very different visiting a place uh, as a tourist or as a, as if for meetings or conversations or stuff like that for short durations versus coming and living. Uh, you know, uh, and... And it is hard to acclimatize yourself. And, and we moved during the pandemic. Uh, pandemic was still going on. So the social distancing made it even more harder to, to, to interact with people, make new friends. Um, but again, I think I will give a lot of credit to the sense of resiliency uh, and adaptiveness. I have lived in 14 houses um, uh, in, in, in my life. So uh, I'm pretty used to being on the move uh, and... I believe found fundamentally, I believe that every move that I've made, whether it was houses or cities, or countries, uh, has brought additional value to me and to my family. Uh, so um, as nervous as, as we were, as difficult the time was, we knew this will pass. 
and uh, you know six months nine months a year uh, we would be good uh, so so yeah and, and that turned out it, it turned out just like that well I, I think it's super interesting what you just said so it, it's not moving it, it's, it's it's not you know, easy um um to move uh, to a different country when you're uh, well in your late 40s um I was wondering how um, how this kind of mindset shapes also your approach towards like the changes in the in the world of HR that we have experienced in the last few years. However, we will experience probably even more change in the next few years. Well, um, when I started my career uh, many years back, and I don't even want to say how many years now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> everything was manual um i you know our hr truly did not have the same level of respect it enjoys today um you really had to fight hard to get a seat on the table uh, with the chief executives or with the alts of whichever organization and you know i was very young obviously i i was i was far away from those tables but i saw even my bosses and managers struggle Uh, to be able to find the relevance in midst of just the priority of running the business uh, to the point where hr became absolutely you know by default hr had had a space on the table there um, i i think the struggle has always been subsequently is to how do you maintain that place how do you keep that place how do you add, continuously add value to the organization so initial times it was just about keeping the lights on um hiring people keeping their documentation keeping you know the the regulatory uh stuff being managed well i think that's the evolution of the function of human resources personal management as it used to be called back then uh to bringing then the development aspects of it how do you learn how do you grow people uh, and so on and so forth uh, and then later came that the concept of business partnering which is where i think people of my generation really greatly benefited because we start we, one is that i would really think our generation of hr partners started to get a little bit more deeper into the business understanding what does that mean what does that business where is the purpose coming from what are we trying to do how how do right kind of people make a difference to your business so hiring people getting more thoughtful about it uh, how how do you assess their performances how do you help them do better uh, as they progress in their career how do you create a brand so that you're able to attract better talent retain them and even when they leave how do you make sure that they are your ambassadors as they go forward um, in their in their careers in their lives and how do they come back to you so i think over time the entire orientation of the function has evolved and changed to becoming more of an evangelist uh, a consultant an advisor uh, a therapist you know so a lot of these things have got and of course process or, in, or, or owners or driving process is that that have to be done like clockwork because people have to be paid you know the pay cycle has to run exactly uh, with zero errors here uh, when people join their onboarding needs to happen there they need to get their formal letters when people leave their settlement needs to be done they need to to get their retirements or whatever dues that they have some of these are you know given i mean nobody really thinks about them any longer uh, it's it's like you know oxygen in the air you just breathe Uh, and then you bring other value adds what do you think are the um, main um, challenges you are currently working on all right so so for the last for many years you know i i'd always been a very strong advocate of um, building a culture of accountability um, building a culture where people find meaning in what they do uh, they find avenues for growth and learning and so this when this opportunity came um, uh, there was a point a few years back when our employees were telling us that they needed more uh, from the organization on uh, their avenues for growth um, and then we said okay growth means that you need to learn you know especially in this era now you need to be on that On, on this quest of learning almost all the time so how do we learn and that is where my this role came around as a as a talent architect and i visualized myself as an architect building a house and that house needed to have a solid foundation uh, of means and mechanisms of how people how should people relate with each other from an inorganizational context so i drew up the 
the structure there are using the context of find, grow, and keep. Uh, how do you find people? Uh, which which has elements? Or how do you find people internally? The right kind of people that you need, and how do you find people from the external market? The second was grow. Uh, once you found them, what kind of assessments people need to have so that you know you have the right kind of people? Uh, and now that you have them, how do you continuously help them grow and develop as you know, as technology evolves, as business evolves, as the need changes and so on and so forth. And then once you have done all of that, how do you keep them and keep them happy, uh, engaged, uh, whether it's your initiatives of, of diversity and, and equity or community outreaches or total rewards, um, listening to people, all of these elements. So, so I build that framework um, which allows the entire HR organization to reorient itself uh, into this paradigm on on how how we do find grow and keep, so that was foundational. And then again, I was just coming out. We were just coming out of the pandemic. We realized that people are no longer working the way they used to in the past. Uh, you you cannot now make people learn simply by putting them in a classroom because classrooms don't exist any longer. You work in you know all kinds of time zones. Uh, you have there is more appreciation for your different style. Uh, of learning and so we came up I came up with this anytime anywhere learning methodology uh, so it doesn't matter where you are uh, it's democratized it, it doesn't matter whether your business unit has money or not if you want, need to learn if you want to learn there's opportunity available to you so so this entire house was was built out with on a solid foundation built the walls of, of these philosophies of anywhere anytime learning uh, a more solid you know methodology of assessment of talent uh, came in along with that, brought in tools and resources for it. Uh, so now we had the house and then we said, people need to have strong leadership capabilities to be able to drive this organization forward. So what should that look like in this, uh, at, in this time in context of our company? We identified six leadership skills that are crucial for us, our success in as we evolve. Uh, and then five stages of leaders from being a new manager for the first time in your life uh, to getting a little bit more, uh, you know, season behind you, middle management and then executive management. So different stages in lives of managers and leaders have different needs of their own learning and development. So brought in programs for that. So my my vision of the house was once you have the basement, you once you have your your foundation done, your walls and the roof in there, everything else is modular. Uh, so be agile. Uh, try something. Um, you don't like the curtains. Change that. You don't like the paint on the wall, you know, put a wallpaper on it. Uh, you don't like the furniture, bring a new set of furniture here. Uh, so that's the way I've approached this thing, being very agile, very iterative. Keep bringing changes as you, as, as you evolve. Keep listening to people and what they're liking, what they're not liking. So not everything that I've tried uh, or have tried has succeeded, uh, but most have. And wherever things have not succeeded, not given the due outcome that we're looking for, we were quick enough to go replace that with something else. In my mind, sometimes in this time and era, again, status quo is our biggest enemy. Uh, and uh, I, I think we've been very successful in pushing the envelope with regards to you know moving off that sense of inertia that status quo brings to you. Well, um, I, I totally hear you. This this is a very um, desirable outcome. However, um, were there some well, some people who were reluctant, so some some obstacles in the way to, to achieve this, well, a, a very agile organization, as you, as you already said, well, it, it's a bit against our our nature of, well, standing still. Well, everyone yeah. says, I don't like it. However, well, most people are pretty, pretty comfortable, right? Absolutely. Like I said earlier, you know, theoretically, everybody says, I love change and change should happen. It's inevitable. But when it happens, you don't like it. Uh, and I'll give you this funny thing is that we launched a program uh, and I was in front of employees and large group of people. And I said, you guys, I mean, and there's a rhetorical question when I was on stage to ask, oh, uh, how many of you guys want to grow? And every, when, every, every hand in the room went up. And it says, uh, how many of you think learning is integral to, to, to growth? Um, so I think majority of hands still went up. And uh, it says, so, so if we bring programs that will help you learn and that should help you grow, uh, how many of you are willing to take out time today to be able to do that? There were lesser hands, but I think still, uh, you know, a lot of hands up. <laughs> yeah. 
and and when we started something and we had booths right outside that that hall for people to go sign up uh you know less than 20% people signed up mm-hmm. so uh, and that 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 you know it dawned upon me i mean intellectually i think i, I understood this earlier but it <laughs> it, it was like that l- learning like many other things is discretionary not everybody has the same muscle uh, or uh, or the need to learn uh, and and so so my philosophy ever since has been um that i will create opportunities for people i i appreciate that somebody some there are some people who love to learn virtually there are some people who would love to come in a class and learn but some people would need a facilitator some would like to do completely on their own and and therefore the need to have that diversity in our offering that allows them to 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 learn at their own at their own will and their own pace the second is draw the right linkages and which is where my next phase of work came in was to say why do i need to learn and how do i know what i need to learn and and that is where we started i started to drive this concept of becoming a skills focused organization uh and it's very important sometimes though we are a technology company we were not very focused about what skills uh, we have or what skills we need so again we built a separate framework for that uh, and brought in technology platform that allows employees to assess their current skills um identify gaps to what they want to do and i always draw this analogy of going on a on a road trip uh you need to have your gps navigation google apple whatever you use it tells you where you are today uh now when you start your journey and and then you you identify where you want to get to and then you have choices uh those choices tells you you want to take uh, you know scenic beautiful routes you want to take pit stops somewhere uh you know you, where you want to refuel yourself you want to relax uh, some people want to go fastest with no no red lights on on the way some some people are comfortable with you know anything so uh, so build that framework where people can identify it's a journey uh, it's it's not a sprint it's it's almost like a marathon to build your career so identify what skills you have today what you need to have for the destination that you want what are intervening goals that you should have what are your pit stops when do you say you have accomplished something that you have accomplished here and then again technology helps you identify that gaps uh, connects you with the learning ecosystem that we have within the organization whether it's training uh, or or opportunities to do projects to gain exposure of find mentors and coaches um, because you know that is all integrated and the net outcome from the organizational perspective is it feeds back to a find of find grow and keep is what skills we have what skills can we grow within the organization and the delta of that is what we need to go higher and get more scientific about what is that we need to be hiring for so i think you know when you connect that desire to learn uh, or need to learn with more tangible outcomes of this learning is going to add value to your skills in in a certain way i think it becomes a lot more easier for people to understand and appreciate because again learning is discretionary you know you have to take out time you have to invest if you know your time and effort to be to learn something so uh, that's the journey that we are on right now well it sounds it sounds pretty amazing and uh, skill focused organization i i really like that that phrase um I have one last question for you. So, what would be a question you would want to ask me, uh, another HR leader? So, what a uh, what would you be interested in? So, Ben, I think you talk to a, you know a you know very different segment of HR, and you you're based out out of Europe, uh, and I'm sure you have you know interfaces across the world. Um, uh, you heard me speak about you know where I am right now in our journey of. Uh, of becoming a skills focused organization here what would you say are challenges that you hear other leaders um uh, or other businesses have with regards to people and uh, and how do you think they are dealing with this well there is a good question you have a, indeed, you have a very different vantage point yeah <laughs> well well indeed i think um i think building a a culture of purpose and a culture of belonging is is indeed a, a great challenge for for many companies at the moment given well there was like lots of um well increase in um in headcount uh, 
a few years ago, then the reverse kind of um, development over the last few months. Um, and therefore, well, this, um, this, this question of, well, where do I belong as an, as, as an individual within this organization that is changing rapidly? I think this is for many companies a real challenge these days. Um, well, and, and I think very, very much connected to that, um, it's also a challenge to, um, to, to provide people with an, uh, with an outlook. So what's going to happen over the next few years given, um, well, I don't want to talk too much about AI, but I think it's, it's um, what many HR leaders realize will be a decisive, um, decisive um, um, impact going forward. Um, so um, something that is really hard to, to grasp, however, which we kind of know will have an, it will have an, a, a great impact. So this is, I think on this matrix, this unknown unknowns. Um, I think it's a known unknown kind of. So, mm -hmm. um, um, so therefore, I think that is something people uh, work on a lot at the moment. And um, well, I think this well purpose for at the moment connected to the purpose going forward and the way how we're going to work going forward is, is I think, um, something that's very much on people's mind and um i don't think that well uh, that, that anyone has found a great answer yet because nobody had a, has a crystal ball but it's i think i think a great challenge at the moment to um to get people aligned and i think it's it's very much since well since there is this big unknown going forward it's very much the question of well what kind of purpose do we serve as an organization now okay. so that that we well since we don't know uh, then so we have kind of no idea what's going to happen in the next few years. We need, well, a strong purpose to get in into the office tomorrow, to go to the office tomorrow, um, well, with a, with a strong belief in what we're doing. And so the alignment of the purpose of the organization to that of the individual, uh, you think, is, is the key yeah. uh, for the evolution right now. I, I can't agree more. I, I think you're absolutely right. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's a lot more challenging in this dispersed world today. Uh, people are calling this hybrid or you know whatever. But you know, unlike the olden days where you could get people in one place and have a common culture, now you have to. Now the challenge is how do you create that sense of commonality, despite being not co-located uh, or seeing people on a day-to-day -day basis. Exactly, and I think when you, when you uh, since we talked about this this before, since well, there is a great unknown going forward. I think since we all well, all, <laughs> I, I love that, that example where you said, okay, who wants change? Uh, so so I think this is exactly where we are, right? So so like everyone is like, well, kind of appreciates the change that that we already foresee. However who's really changing and who's who's embracing this change. I think there's a, a great challenge for most companies. And well, the, I think the only thing we can do is, okay, we, we are like, okay, we can't provide you with, with an outlook that uh, is, is longer than a few months. However, what we can provide you with is a great purpose, why you should be motivated to be at your desk tomorrow morning and to do the best you can, given, well, there's a great purpose since, um, well, nobody knows what's going to happen. Got it. Yeah, absolutely. You're spot on. Susan. Okay. Yeah, I do that again. Shashank, thank you so much. It was, was lovely talking to you. Thank you so much for everything you said. I love the part around the skill driven organization. I think it's very, very much forward looking. Thank you so much again. It was, was great talking to you. And thank you, Ben, for having me here. I, I think it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Uh, and I, I felt like I'm talking to a friend. Uh, so thank you very much for, for that. I can only echo that. And uh, well, to all of you guys who have listened in, thank you so much for listening in. And see you next time.